The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. He is risen. risen Hallelujah. Well, my dear Christian friends, we come to this Easter Sunday. Our theme, carrying through from our Lenten uh, sermon series, Follow Me, is follow me from, that word is important, follow me from the empty tomb. So I say that because during the whole of Lent, we've been uh, asked to follow Jesus two things. Follow me to compassion, something we need in this world desperately right now. And all God's people said, amen. Follow me to compassion. Follow me to the lost and the least. Follow me to prayer. Follow me to patience. No one wanted to hear that one, right? All of those things that are part and parcel of us who are, in fact, followers of Jesus. Now, I know that what you you typically call yourself a Christian, and praise be to God. The book of Acts is clear. It was in Antioch that they were first called Christians. Uh, You might call yourself a disciple of Christ, but de facto, no matter what other titles you use, you are a follower of Jesus. As Jesus said it, deny yourself, take up your cross, and say it with me, follow me. All right, so follow me, two things, but today, basically, we could have gone all the way back to Ash Wednesday and preached this sermon on Ash Wednesday. Because it is from this tomb, the risen Christ leading us, that we follow him into this world for compassion, patience, prayer, all of those things. People just don't like to hear an Easter sermon on Ash Wednesday. Amen? (laughs) Right, amen. All right, so that's where we're at today. So I want to give you an image here. Notice again, you know, this obviously, this was taken in... On Easter Sunday, long ago, Jesus had his picture taken, all right? Um, But notice again, I I got this picture for you because Jesus is outside the tomb and walking away. And this is important because you as a Christian are called to that very thing, to walk away, I'll say it a little bit differently, walk away from the dead things in this world and follow Jesus to life. Jesus said it this way, I've come that you may have life and life abundant, following him you have life and life abundant, not stuck in the dead things of this world. So I just picked off from Luke 24, 5. Why do you seek the living among the dead, the angel said? I would say that to all of us. Why do you seek life among the dead things of this world when true life and life abundant is only found in Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. All right. So let's look at a couple of things. I'm just going to give you a few vignettes from the story, uh, from the narrative. So I asked first, are you stuck like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus? Let me just remind you who those two guys are before I take you to a Bible passage. So Joseph of Arimathea, of course, was a ruler of the Sanhedrin. In my opinion, he may, I, I, I put in a may there, may have been the rich young ruler of Matthew 19 that walked away from Jesus. We're never told, but I think it's interesting that he, in fact, was a wealthy guy. And, but that's obvious from what happened at the, uh, the tomb, and I'm going to read that to you in just a second, uh, but that he was also uh, uh, eventually became, as you'll hear read, eventually became a disciple of Jesus. And Nicodemus, of course, we call him Nick at night, uh, because in, in uh, John chapter 3, Nicodemus you know, came quietly to talk to Jesus in the nighttime, and that's where we get God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc. All right, so you have Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. If you have a Bible or a device, I'd encourage you to open it. If you don't, the page number on the screen is the blue Bible, and if you want to just listen, you're welcome to do that too. All right, so John 19, 38 to 42 is actually the burial of Jesus. We need to start there. Again, we're at the tomb walking away from it, and so this is the story of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus burying the Lord Jesus. I want you to notice, too, that clearly Joseph of Arimathea had some influence because Pilate was no friend of the Jews. And so for a member of the Sanhedrin to come and him to grant the body of Jesus was a big deal, in my opinion. So after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So they came and took uh, away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come, there you go, Nick at night, come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Listen to this, Christian, about 75 pounds. I'll come back to that in a second. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths, as you know, 
uh, Pastor and I were talking about the Shroud of Turin before worship services, so that, that's what they believe that it is. So bound it in linen cloths with spices, as uh, is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, Joseph's tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish uh, day of preparation, that is Friday, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So all right, what's going on with these guys? So understand that they heard the Lord Jesus talk about his resurrection. Uh, just take a, a perusal through the Gospels, and over and over again, Jesus says, okay, look, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. They're going to be mean to me. They're going to malign me. They're going to mock me. They're going to beat me. They're going to crucify me. But it's like they, it was like they had stoppers in their ears all of a sudden. He always said it, but I will rise on the third day. And yet the other disciples, and I would suggest to you even Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, didn't hear it. Where were Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus on this day? They're living with a dead God, you see, a dead Christ, a dead Messiah. You know how you know that? They put 75 pounds of spices and things on his body. The Jewish rite of burial was about five pounds. This was like a, and probably intended to be a kingly burial. And we, we go, yay and amen, king of kings and lord of lords, right? Of course, right? But what it was saying is, we're going to put all this stuff on him because he's not, if you believed with all of your heart that in a day and a half, you know, by hours anyway, it's three days by the Jewish count, if in a day and a half he's going to raise from the dead, you're not going to stick all that stuff. You don't need it. His body's not going to stink because it's not going to decay. He's going to raise from the dead. And maybe that's where you are at today. Maybe you're still living in the tomb of the dead Christ. You have doubts in your hearts about Jesus? Maybe, maybe today you came here because grandmother said, you want ham and potatoes at lunch? Come to church. <laughs> and all the grandmothers said, amen, right? <laughs> There's going to be a lot of children in heaven because grandma's got them baptized. Let's put it that way, all right? It's, it's true, all right? So maybe you don't believe. This is, this is the cool thing about Christianity. We want you here. We want you here, but we want you to hear something else. He's not dead. He's alive, you see. He is alive. And let me make sure you understand something. If you're in this zone, and please, again, there is no judgment here, not at all. I'm going to tell you right now, this guy that's worked for Jesus for 43 years has doubts in his heart, too. Everybody goes through it. But if you're in doubt and unbelief, let me just remind you, it is an historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. It's not just faith. It's also fact. You heard Pastor Reed. 500 people saw Jesus alive. Jesus walked this earth for 40 days after his resurrection. In fact, I, I'm convinced that Jesus wanted to prove that he was alive. Remember when he says, do you guys got anything to eat? It's like, you know, can you see Jesus going over to the, to the fridge and he opens the fridge? He goes, man, I'm telling you what, dying on a cross makes one hungry. All right, I need some food. What was he doing? He was proving that he was alive. Touch me, I'm alive. It is an historical fact. And, and so I would only say this, if you're living in the doubt slash, you know, motoring into unbelief zone about the Lord Jesus Christ, I would only say this, this is the deal. If you are correct and Jesus isn't really Messiah, Jesus isn't really the way, the truth, and the life, then as a Christian, I've lived a good life. I love my family. I, no perfection here. I say it this way to, to folks. I work for the guy that walks on water. I do not, all right? But I've loved my family, paid my taxes when I was told to. I go to work and I do a good job. I, I love people. I'm compassionate reach into people's lives. So if you're right and Jesus is still dead and there's bones somewhere, then okay, well, I did a good life and I'll go push up daisies when I die, okay? But if we're right, you understand, right? If Christianity is true, then you got a much bigger problem than I do. And, and Christian, non-Christian alike, I simply say to you, Check it out. Check it out. There are a billion and a half people walking this planet that believe, that are saying today, by the way, he's risen, he's risen indeed. They believe that he is risen. They believe that he's alive. And I would simply ask you, check it out yourself. See if what we are saying is true. 
my hope for you is that you'll find Christ if you don't know him already. It's all right. Maybe it's doubt or unbelief. Maybe it's something else. So Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene is such a great, great figure in the New Testament. And again, I, I want to suggest that she's probably the 13th disciple. She was so dedicated to Jesus. Let me just remind you why she was so dedicated to Jesus. Because you understand, it, well, you can, if you read Luke 7, the end, and the beginning of 8, you'll get the idea. Luke 7 at the end is the uh, story of the sinful woman that came and anointed Christ's feet, cried on him and wiped him with her hair, right? And then right away, Luke tells us, it seems like that might be Mary Magdalene, because right away, uh, Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene was one of the women that followed Jesus, and that Jesus, listen closely, Christian, Jesus had cast seven demons out of her body. Now, I tell you that because if God does something amazing for you. you know, I don't know, let me just do something ridiculous. You get a job promotion, all right? You get a job promotion. What do you do? Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me, right? You, you're invested in the Lord even more because of what he did. Can you imagine if you had seven demons and he took them out of you and you were able to be normal and out and about and in public? You'd love him with every fiber of your being. You'd follow him wherever he asked you to go. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that in the garden, guess who we find? <laughs> the boys are back playing pool, you know? And there's Mary Magdalene in the garden. So let me take you to the next passage. It's uh, John chapter 20, verses 11 down to 18. You, you know this famous story, I'm sure. Mary stood, notice where she is. She's still at the tomb. Jesus wants to lead her away from the tomb. So weeping outside the tomb she was, and she we as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of, notice Jesus isn't there, his, his angels are, all right? Uh, Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? You see, they know Jesus is alive. She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher or my teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and my God. And Mary goes and announces to the disciples, of course. Now, I want to make, make a, an important point here. Mary was clinging to Jesus in a way that indicates, I'll, I'll give you a similar thing. Transfiguration, uh, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And what does Peter say? Hey, let's build some houses for you guys to hang out in. All right? Similarly, with Mary, Jesus was saying to her, look, you can't, you can't cling to this situation. I will ascend into heaven, all right? That's where she was at. She was stuck at the tomb. She was stuck with a dead Savior. And, and in fairness, in fairness to both, or all three of them, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and Mary Magdalene, the Lord was hiding from their eyes who he really was until he rose from the dead in fairness to her. But what was really going on in her heart, I'm gonna suggest to you she was grieving she was grieving. And so for you, maybe it's something like that that's got you stuck at the tomb. Maybe you're grieving the loss of a loved one or the loss of a marriage or the loss of a job or the loss of a child or the loss of whatever, what, what used to be, right? You used to be able to remember things and now you can't remember them. Maybe you're grieving those things. Maybe it's something, in other words, that has been imposed on you that is hamstring, it's the best way to say it, hamstringing you from following Jesus. You're stuck in that thing, whatever it is. And all of the things, by the way, I thought today, man, I opened up my computer, I couldn't believe it. There was another shooting in Pittsburgh today, or maybe it was yesterday, I don't know, but it, it another one, right? We get rid of COVID, basically, and here comes Putin, right? One thing after another, after another in this world, keeping us in the dead zone, you see, instead of following Jesus. And please, Christian, do not hear me in any way denigrate what you're going through. You know what? Christians do grieve the loss of things, the loss of loved ones. We just simply grieve with hope. Hope of what? A living Christ. My family is not dead. They are quite alive. And in the presence of Jesus, 
And Jesus calls us, come out of that. Come out of that grief, that fear, that what is it for you today? Maybe that addiction, maybe that relationship, maybe that sin that is hamstringing you and keeping you from fully following Jesus. All right, so what's the answer to it? Well, I asked the question, and I'm going to do it again. Are you following Jesus to life, or are you hanging out in the dead zone? Let me give you the last passage, John 20, verses 19 to 23. So verse 19, I want you to notice something here. The disciples were locked away. Listen closely. Jesus came to them. The disciples were locked away, and Jesus came to them. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, that is Sunday, of course, uh, the doors being locked where the disciples were for what? For fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them, notice the gospel here, showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. This is the the power of God given to the church to forgive sins. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold them, the forgiveness, it is withheld, all right? So again, the power of the church to forgive sins there. But I want you to notice something. See, I could say to you, all right, you're in doubt, unbelief. You're hamstrung by grief or addiction or a relationship or a sin or a fear or whatever it is. And I can say, come on now. Come on, buck it up. Let's go follow Jesus, would ya? But that's not the way Jesus acts. See, he wants to bring you to that place. He wants to bring you to a different place, from the place of death to the place of life. And he does that. Remember, when Jesus said, peace be with you, they received that peace because Jesus' word is performative. It does what he says in the moment. He says to the storm, peace be still. And guess what? It stops. The same thing is true about the disciples. He spoke peace in them. And then, I said it a moment ago, he gave them the gospel. Look, look, you can still see the nail marks. And you can see where they stuck me in the side. But I'm alive. I died, yes. I died. But I'm alive now. Let's go. As the Father has sent me. What, what did he say? So now I am sending you. Yes. Let's go. Understand what I'm saying to you, Christian, is this. Jesus wants to take you to a different place than you're at right now. He wants to take you in a deeper way in your relationship to him. Not a cursory Sunday only kind of thing, but that I love God more than life itself. I want to follow Jesus wherever he is. If he really reversed death on Easter Sunday, then he's worthy of following. Amen? He calls you to that. But I want you to notice what our Lord always does. Well, I'll do it. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. You understand God comes to you. In his living and active word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between bone and marrow, soul and spirit, judging the thoughts and intentions of man's heart, or the gospel, which is, as Romans 1.16 says it, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But he wants you. He's calling you. He wants to take you by the hand and lead you to life and life abundant. In fact, I'm going to give you one last image on the screen to keep in your brain. Jesus isn't just doing this. Go, boy. Come on, girl. Jesus is taking you by the hand and leading you forward in this life and an abundant life in him. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. All right. So <laughs> I always appreciate when the kids are in the building. I get, a, I get a delayed amen when the kids are in the building. It's fantastic. So I want to just lay out a challenge for you this week, and maybe it's today, maybe it's today, is that you as a family would talk about what I just said. Be honest with each other. Isn't it it time for us to be honest with each other and just say, this is where I'm at. I'm not doing great. I'm in doubt and unbelief. Whatever it is, wherever, I love Jesus, wherever you're at. I know some of you are saying, nah, Joe, just want the ham and potatoes, thanks, you know. And some are going, no, we're going to hide Easter eggs in the snow drifts, right? (laughs) Cubs fans, okay, I'm just saying, all right. (laughs) 
I'm really not that hateful, I promise, all right? What I would encourage you to do is be moved by this truth that Jesus doesn't want to leave you where you are. He wants to take you to a new place of abundant life because he is the way, the truth, and the life. May you be enabled to do that in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.